Well, good morning again. It is a joy to get to bring the word to you this morning as we continue through our series on the book of 1 Corinthians. Before we get started, I just need to give you a little warning. I'm working through some sinus infection issue up here. Um, I'm on antibiotics, so I'm not contagious. Um, But just, y'all can pray my voice hangs out. So um, that's why I've got water up here. So hopefully we'll be all good. So here we go. We are calling this series on 1 Corinthians, Life Through the Lens of the Gospel. Because really, that is Paul's goal with this letter. He wants to change the lens through which the church in Corinth is looking at life. And if you wear glasses, then you know how important the lens through which you look matters. So now I wear trifocals because I have complicated eyes. And when I first got these glasses, oh boy, man, was that a thing I had to learn how to do. Right after I got them, I went to the grocery store and proceeded to fall down in the produce aisle because I tipped my head in the wrong direction. (laughs) Looking through the exact right lens on my glasses is very important. And sometimes it requires me to tip my head in a very odd way which gives my children more ammunition to make fun of me. But if I want to see the words I'm reading or the road in front of me, then I have to do what it takes to make sure that my focus is in the right place. And the same is true in life. It matters what lens we use to look at our lives. If we look at our lives through the lens of success or popularity, or trying to gain authority, or really any other lens but the lens of the gospel, then our focus is going to be off, and our vision is going to be blurry. Paul desperately wanted these early believers at the church in Corinth to understand how important this was. And so in today's passage, what he's going to do is he's going to begin to lay it out for them. Much like when you go to the eye doctor and they put that big machine in front of your eyes. And then to find the right prescription, you know, they flip that thing and they go, this one or this one, this one. And you're like, I don't know. (laughs) Until they find the one that allows you to see with perfect clarity. That's what Paul's doing right here. He's tried several different approaches. And here in the second chapter of this letter, he is going to employ what I call the KISS method. Now, KISS stands for keep it short and simple. I know, I know. I taught middle school. It actually stands for keep it simple, stupid. But stupid is a bad word. And if I use that in my middle school class, it just derailed the lesson for the whole day. So we had to adjust. So that's what Paul is doing here. He's adjusting, adjusting the lens because he desperately wants these people to hear that they need to understand life through the one lens that's going to help them see Jesus better. And that's going to change everything. So let's go to the word. Our text for this morning <clears throat> is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 16. So brothers and sisters, would you listen now to the very word of God? And so it is with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who loved him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, for who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them. In the same way, 
No one knows the thoughts of God except for the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but a person is not subject to merely human judgments for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as a third year seminary student, I read theology books in my spare time. And as your lay pastor who has the great privilege of getting to preach here often, I also read theology books in my work time. So sometimes, sometimes I say things at the dinner table that no one understands. Sometimes I use words like Trinitarian, or I feel the need to talk about classical theism or the theories of atonement, and y'all, no one cares. No one. The other day I read this sentence when I was preparing for an exam, I was reading one of my books, and it went like this. Trinitarian theism is important, as it is a means by which our conception of God is derived first and foremost from a biblical narrative, especially as focused on by a Christological lens. I was so excited about this, and I, I thought, this, this has a lot to do with what I'm preaching, and so I thought, well, I'm going to talk to my husband about this. <laughs> so I, I did, and he just stared at me blankly, and he goes, "Hun, if you're going to talk like that, then I'm going to bring home engineering equations for you to solve at the dinner table as well. It's like, fair point. All right, maybe we should just stick to talking about college football. For those of you who don't know, I went to Georgia, my husband went to Tech, my children go all over the ACC, I mean the SEC. There are a lot of topics off limits at our house. Anyway, the point is this. Theology is great. It is exciting, and I love to study it, but y'all, it does nothing to further the kingdom of God if people have no idea what I'm talking about. Knowing all of the things written in the books, being able to throw around these big words that might get me an A on my exam, if I'm lucky. But according to Paul and his letter to the Corinthians, I had better be careful. Paul opens up this chapter in verse 1 by saying, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. Now, as we read this letter, a couple things I want to point out. First of all, Paul is referring to a prior trip that he had made to see the church in Corinth. And also, I want to point out one thing. Paul did not write his letter in chapters. I know you know this, okay? But sometimes, especially when we read the letters of Paul, we can tend to think of them in separate chunks. But when this letter was written, it was written as one whole document. And y'all thought I read you a lot of scripture. When it was read to that church, they read the whole thing. So it's really important when we read these letters that we look back so that we can understand what it's connecting to. Otherwise, we're tempted to get the meaning really wrong. So when Paul says, and so it was with me, we must think, and so what was? If you look back at the end of the previous chapter, you'll see that Paul was talking about the wisdom of God and the dangers of boasting of our own accomplishments and our own wisdom. Chapter 1 ends with this warning. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And then he moves on to talk about how this has affected his ministry. Now, Paul, prior to coming to Corinth, had been in the city of Athens. And his hope was to start a church there in Athens. Now, at this time, Athens was the cultural center of the Mediterranean world. And so, as Paul was there, he took a very intellectual approach to preaching the gospel. As Pastor Hubie talked about the last couple of weeks, there were incredibly wise teachers there. They had lots of followings with them in Athens. And so, Paul took after them. 
He delved into philosophical sources. He tried to relate the gospel to them by winning at their rhetorical game. And he gave a lot of great speeches. A lot of people listened to him. If you read Acts, you can read some of those speeches. But here's the thing. No church was actually started there in Athens. And Paul was an educated man. He refers to himself as a Hebrew of Hebrews. But even in all of his wisdom, none of his arguing could convince these people to believe in Jesus. So when he comes to Corinth, he realizes he's got to change his tactics. Now, eloquence, eloquence and rhetorical excellence weren't going to get him anywhere. Author and historian Kenneth Bailey wrote a book called Paul Through Mediterranean Eyes. This is a book that Pastor Hubie and I are reading as we work through this series. He writes this about Paul's change in tactics as he comes to Corinth. He says, initially, <clears throat> Paul knew that Corinth wasn't Athens. Quoting Greek philosophical sources would mean nothing to Corinthian dock workers and day laborers. So how does Paul handle things when he comes to Corinth? Well, I think verses 2 through 5 spell it out pretty well. Look at what he says. He says, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. I've read those words so many times this week, I just feel the need to say amen when I get to the end of them. For those of us who preach and who teach and for all of us who love Jesus and who want to share that love with others, these words of Paul's need to serve as our guardrails. We do not come to anyone with a message that's about us. We do not want people to put their faith in us and to follow us. We want them to see the power of the Holy Spirit. Because it's not in our power that the gospel takes root in anyone's life. And our faith isn't placed in our own ability to have eloquent speech and abundant wisdom and convince people to do anything. But we are not called to be silent or to keep the good news to ourselves. The first time I ever shared the gospel message with someone, the Lord made sure I understood it had nothing to do with me. I was a 19-year-old college kid, a young life leader, took a bunch of kids up to camp for the first time. While we were there, I had the privilege of working the ropes course all day long. And then that night, I had the extra special privilege of being the leader who got not one, but two whipped cream pies thrown in her face. And then we played some game with Cheetos because I distinctly remember I had Cheetos stuck all in the whipped cream that was all over my face. And then we did a bunch of screaming and singing and I lost my voice much like I have right now. And finally it was close to midnight and freezing cold and we made our way back to the cabin and one of the girls goes, hey Lee, can I talk to you? And I was like, what? Now? And sure, yeah, let's sit down. So we sat down in the cold and she proceeds to ask some really difficult questions. She's working through what does it mean to invite Jesus into her life? And she was pretty sure because of some choices she had made that Jesus wanted nothing to do with her. And I was exhausted. I had no voice. I still have Cheetos and whipped cream in my face. And I'm going, okay, what did I learn? What Bible verse should I share with her? Like, well, what theology do I, do I talk to her about? But I had nothing. So finally, I just looked at her and I said, Katie, Katie, I think you've got it all wrong. Jesus just loves you no matter what. And y'all never forget what happened next. She looked right at me and she said, I believe you. Can you just pray so I can invite him into my heart? And I was like, this had nothing to do with me. And so right there in the freezing cold, covered in whipped cream and Cheetos, I got to pray to invite Jesus into Katie's heart. And then I had the privilege of watching the next three years as the Lord worked in her life and changed her. She would often introduce me as the young life leader who convinced me to follow Jesus. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I was just the young life leader 
who got to witness the Lord lead you to himself. This is what Paul is saying here. He's not trying to build up followers of himself. He's not using fancy words or clever speech to coerce anyone into his way of thinking. And although some of the, this change is probably due to the challenges he faced in Athens, I actually think that it also had to do with something that shifted within Paul. As the Lord was growing him into the apostle that he was calling him to be. I think it's the same thing that I learned on that freezing cold night. It has nothing to do with me and everything to do with the work of the Spirit. Paul writes these things. He says, we declare God's wisdom. And then he goes on in verse 10 to say, these are the things that God has revealed to us by his Spirit. It's not about how knowledgeable we are. It's not about how many big words we can use, how, what a great speaker we are, how well we can lay out the gospel plan. It's about the work of the Spirit. In verse 12, Paul says, what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. My high school friend, asking to invite Jesus into her heart, had absolutely nothing to do with my eloquent speech or my cool factor. The Lord had to cover me in whipped cream and Cheetos and make me lose my voice so that every time I think about that night, I am reminded that I was just a conduit. I was not the coolest young life leader who scored another point for the kingdom, lest I boast about my awesome evangelism skills. Now, Paul is pushing against a couple issues here that they're dealing with in Corinth as he talks about the wisdom as it is revealed by the Spirit of God. The first is the class separation system that existed here. Last week, Pastor Hubie gave you some very important math facts about how many slaves lived within this city. You all know I don't speak math, so I'm going to say it in words. There were a lot. A lot. <laughs> and there were also a lot of disenfranchised, underpaid dock workers who worked there because this was a port city. And then you had the middle class who could earn a living. And then above them, you had the rich and the rulers. And this, this class separation, economic barriers, it carried over into the church and it separated the people there too. So Paul, he's trying to even out the playing field a little bit. When he tells the church, he says, the rulers of this age are coming to nothing. And that as for the wisdom of God, none of the rulers of the world understood it. God can work through you, he was telling them. You can understand him and you can know him. And it has nothing to do with what kind of job you have or how much money you make. It has everything to do with the way you allow the spirit of God to work through you. Now, the Spirit of God, this was a difficult concept for the Corinthians to understand. And I get it. When I was a child, the first time I heard about the Holy Ghost, y'all, I thought it was a literal ghost. Like, I used to picture it with the white sheet and the big eyes, like, woo, hovering around. I don't think that's what the Corinthians thought. But they struggled to understand what it meant. They didn't get it. And Paul knows that they're only in the beginning stages of understanding. This idea of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It tripped up the early church from the very beginning. Because here's the thing, many of these folks coming to believe in the one true God had been pagan worshipers. They had worshiped multiple gods. So the idea of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost as being three separate gods, well, that made sense to them. They just transferred that right over. Paul spent a lot of time trying to correct this. In this specific part of the letter, he's trying to get them to see that the Spirit of God, the mind of God, and the Word of God are all connected. Basically, he says it works much like it does within one person. Our spirit, our mind, and our mouth are all connected. We're all one. And even today, we struggle with how to articulate this. There just aren't words or analogies to wrap around the holy things of God. 
I like the way Isaiah puts it in the passage that Pastor Hubie read for us earlier, where the Lord tells the prophet Isaiah, he says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. Paul knows that the message he is sharing with them is hard to understand, but he also knows the Lord doesn't leave us in our misunderstanding. We might not be able to speak the holy language of God, but he came and spoke our language. And in verse 13, Paul says, this is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. And those words, and that message, it's really quite simple. God loves you. God came in the form of Jesus and he gave his life to save you. Jesus was crucified because the world did not understand him. The wisdom of the world thought this was all foolishness. But even in death, God was victorious. Jesus rose again from the dead and then he sent his spirit to come and dwell within us. And all of this, all of it, is foolishness to the world. This news and this message, it set captives free. It allows regular, ordinary people to share in the mysterious, wonderful knowledge of God. It erases social and economic boundaries. And it sets us apart from the things of this world. Paul says that we have been given the mind of Christ. But here's the thing. We do have to open our mouths and speak it. There's a saying that's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. I don't know if he really said it. He gets credit for lots of things he might not have said. But it goes like this. Preach the gospel at all times. And when necessary, use words. Now, this is true. Our actions do preach for us whether we like it or not. And we know that. But it is becoming more and more necessary that we learn to use our words. And that is why. It is so important that we stay connected to the Spirit of God so that when we do open our mouths and when we do use our words, the words don't come from us. They're not some drummed up human wisdom that point back to how great we are and how much we know. Instead, they are words of the Spirit that preach only Jesus and rest only in God's power. I want to close with a story that a pastor friend of mine told me when I first started to sense that the Lord was calling me into ministry. He's a hilarious guy, big, tall guy, takes up a lot of space wherever he is, big, booming voice that could fill this place without a microphone. And he said that when he first got into ministry, people told him he was born to be a preacher. They told him he was gifted. He was going to grow the kingdom. The Lord was going to use him. And he said, Lee... I believed it. He's like, I started to preach like I was great. And the more I did that, the more people told me how great I was. And he said, it made me dangerous. He was called to a small church and he grew that church three times its size. And he said, people came to hear me preach. And as he began to believe that, he began to isolate himself. And to not listen to the wise counsel of others around him. And he said one day, he was sitting in the back of the sanctuary of his church in the dark. Contemplating a big falling out he'd had with his session. And while he was sitting there, a mom and a little girl from his church, they walked by the hallway. And they didn't see him. And the little girl kind of broke away from her mom. And she starts running down the aisle of the church. And at their church, on the back wall is a huge, big stained glass window with a picture of Jesus. And the little girl goes running up the aisle and she turns back around and she goes, Hey mom, I didn't know there was Jesus back there. Where's the big man that stands up there and talks all the time so we can't see Jesus? My friend said, those words changed his life. He said he fell to his knees right there in the sanctuary. He said, Lee, I wanted nothing to do with that big man who stood up there and kept everyone from seeing Jesus. He said it changed his whole ministry. Friends, we have to learn how to share Jesus with others and then get out of the way and let the Spirit do its work. 
And it doesn't matter whether you stand in a pulpit, or whether you sit across the table from a friend, or hang out in the hallways full of crowded students, work in an office full of really smart people. We are all, we are all called to preach the message of Jesus with our lives. And then get out of the way and let the Spirit do its work. And the message isn't complicated or fancy. In fact, it's really much better if you just keep it simple. The message is this. Jesus loves you. This I know. Because the Bible tells us so. Go and preach that. Alleluia. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you this morning so thankful for your spirit and for the way you draw near to us.